Saga, thanks a lot for having me this afternoon. I'm very excited to taste the Stalin Zuck uh, 2009 Semyon Reserve. Oh, nice to have you here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to taste it. I haven't had this for the last couple of months, so it's, um, it's going to be quite nice to Wait, taste it Wait, but you again. say you haven't, you've tasted this in the last few months already. I tasted it. I took a bottle with me to Oman when uh, Janet and I visited James and Dominique. Yes, yeah, that's crazy. Um, what, a month or so ago? So, so yeah, for those who don't know, where, where is Oman? Oman is up just above Saudi Arabia and above Yemen. Okay. Up uh, next door to the Emirates. Aren't they quite difficult when it comes to wine, though, or alcohol in general? Well, it's a, it's a Muslim country, so, you know, the, the local population don't drink wine or okay. don't drink alcohol. But, I mean, obviously, they, they have a large tourism sort of infrastructure, etc. Yeah. And I know that they're building on that. Um, and they've, they've got businessmen and expats there, you know, <clears> in the hotels and stuff. So, I mean, you can get... Yeah, for sure. Why there's there's, there's definitely there's a lot of thirsty people that side for sure. <laughs> I guess so, guys. Let's let's get straight into this. Can you first tell me a little bit more about yourself? What got you into wine making, and where you've produced thus far? Well, what got me into wine is really just I, I, I actually don't know. I don't know what <laughs> it is. Um, I, I started making wine when I was a light at school. Um, I uh, I think I first used to pick the grapes from the the pergola. The sort of um, we're actually sitting the, under uh, a pergola at the moment not not <laughs> not the one but <laughs> a similar one um, i used to pick the grapes when i was at primary school man i used to pick those grapes and turn them into grape juice and where other families had orange juice for, for <laughs> breakfast we had freshly squeezed grape juice uh, and then at, at high school um sort of got into the fermentation and i i'm very lucky that i had parents who were sort of like open-minded enough to let me play with these things yeah. um, and so I used to make wine from anything I mean oranges and apples and rose petals and the, coffee beans and this is seriously uh, good information especially for where uh, you know if another lockdown comes uh, about <laughs> you can apparently yeah, make yeah. wine from rose petals <laughs> <laughs> just takes a while um, yeah and and you know it was it was just really a hobby that turned into my career it's um as far as where I've made wine, I, I, I studied wine making at, at Elsenberg. It's more practical versus theory orientated, right? Yeah, it's for door folks like me. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no, I think it's a, it's a very di different kind of a course. You know, the, the, uh, the BSc at, at Stellenbosch has obviously turned out some great successes in this country's wine making. Um, but there again, so is Elsenberg, yeah. and and I don't think it's that one is necessarily better or worse than the other. It's like just different, kind of like one. Is is there some kind of a like competition between? There's uh, lots, the of rubble, <laughs> you know, lots of rubble. Lots of rubble, yeah, for absolutely. sure. But guy, in terms of uh, where you've produced, uh, what wine estates have you been involved with? Uh? My my f my first job was um, at what was then Bertram's okay. Winery in in Devon Valley. I remember Bertram's brand new. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, <laughs> well, it was part of the Gilby's. Uh, uh, company um, and Gilby's did you know, Smirnoff and Bertram's brandies and um, Bertram's wines. Obviously, they also used to make the Elfin range okay. and Valley, um, the big Valley five liter boxes. I think those were sort of the initial or the first five liter boxes together with Cellacost back okay. in the day. Okay. Anyway, um, that was just to the side. Um, so I started off at Bertram's and then I, I went from Bertram's, I went to Clomol Verne. Okay. Um, spent a couple of years with Seymour Pritchard uh, making basically what, red wines at Clomol Verne. And then in the later years, we did some rosé and white as well. Okay. Um, and from there, I moved on just a little bit further up the valley to uh, Devon Hill Winery, okay. which is now, I think they call it Grand, Grand Domain. Okay. Um, and from there, I went to Stellenzer. Nice. And I was at Stellenzer. <clears throat> from 98 until 2017, so quite a long time. Um, and I remained, well, I still am with the Schreiber family who, uh, who I joined at Stillenzer, so that's quite cool. Yeah, so, so how long were you, you say, at Stillenzer? Well, from 98 to 2017, so that's what, 19 years? Yeah, that's a long time. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a nice stint. Um, great place, great farm, great company, it was, yeah, lovely place to be i mean it's it's always difficult on uh, you know moving on from a brand that you kind of established 
Uh, but I guess well, it's I, just, I certainly didn't establish. Stillism. Well, I mean, if you spend that kind of amount of time, you, you're yeah, doing a lot of hard work. Yeah, but Stillism was very much established by the time I got there. I mean, Marinus Bradil started there. Um, he, in fact, built the winery okay. um, for, for Schreiber. Um, and then he was succeeded by um, Andre von Rensburg. Uh, uh, Andre was there for I suppose four or five years I'm before he went on to. I'm assuming Berlin. that when he was there, there was no pinotage. Huh? Um, <laughs> there were pinotage vines, but not pinotage wines. Yeah, um, yeah, and I mean, Andre, I suppose, really put, in fact, not suppose, I think, very definitely put Stillisant on the map yeah. um, from that point of view. Um, and yeah, then I took over. So you know, far from far from um, putting Stillisant on the map, I sort of tried to maintain the, <laughs> the name that it had. Yeah, well, you did a great job. And uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I can definitely tell it was Halloween the other day. Do you know how? Because this wine is scary good. Oh. <laughs> From what I've picked up. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, first of all, have a look at the color. I mean, this is what we would classify as like medium gold. Medium gold. Yeah, I think, in fact, yeah, this is probably more than medium gold. More like liquid gold. Probably, probably, <laughs> probably gold, yeah. The interesting thing, I mean, if I look at it against your your white paper there, it's um, there's actually still quite a little touch of green there, which is quite it is. Quite but, funky. but I mean, it goes uh, very well with your watch. Oh, thanks. Check it out. <laughs> but I mean, actually, uh, straight off the bat, there's a bit of priming considering that the bottle says, you know, it's still going to age for another four to five years after 2009. We drink it in yeah, 2021. We, 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 <laughs> 20, uh, yeah, so we yeah, coming up for 13 years old yeah, now. Yeah, and it's drinking like the boss. So I mean. 2009, it was regarded as one of South Africa's greatest vintages. Can you maybe tell us why that is? Well, look, my recollection of 20, 2009 was that it was a slightly cooler than normal vintage and with sort of quite normal rainfall. Um, and that, that Semillon vineyard, um, I can't remember exactly how old it was, but in 2009, it was probably... Uh, it was probably about 15 or 16 years old okay, at that okay. stage. Um, Which is a decent and, age. Yeah, I mean, it certainly wasn't a youngster at that stage. So, um, and, and you know, Andre had already, Andre and, and Bula Heber was there for a year as well after Andre. And both of them had, had made some really, really good uh, semions mm. from that vineyard, um, you know, before I got there. And um, that vineyard had drip irrigation and I would imagine that that particular vintage with the sort of average and slightly above average rainfall. Okay. I would imagine, and once again, I'd have to go and check the figures, but I would imagine that it would have had at least a post-harvest irrigation okay. at, after the 2008 vintage, because okay. that was always quite an important yeah, yeah, okay. thing for us. So, yeah, the, the fact... You know the the wine is what it is, and that it's maintained its um hundred percent. It's maintained what it has for this long. I think is testament to the fact yeah. that not only is a good vineyard, good uh, um, good location, all the rest of it, yeah. all the good intrinsics for, sure. of, for the wine. But I think we are probably also a very good vintage. There's there's uh, definitely some honeysuckle, there's nuts, and I actually got some marmalade now as well. The further you get into it, I think the wine is obviously going to open up as we go along. But yeah, absolutely. But for Semyon, I mean, I'm not saying that, I know there are places out there that are specifically producing Semyon to go the distance. Yeah. But I mean, was this something that you had in mind at the time, or was it something? Well, that I you think were... that I think that the Stellans of Semyons had always gone the distance. Okay. Um, that was that was just one of the things, you know, um, and I think that Semyon, together with uh, um, other varieties, <clears throat> but I think that Semyon has shown itself to be a variety that yeah. can go the yeah. distance. This wine was never produced to sort of be a, a, a bottle today, drink tomorrow sure. kind of a wine. Yeah, sure. you know? it was oh, especially always, carrying it the was, term reserve. Yeah, absolutely. And this was this was always our sort of flagship white wine. Um, until 2010, I think. 2010, I think we stopped making it. Okay. If I, uh, my memory is fading. But anyway. <laughs> um, so I think that this was one of the one of the last vintages of, of the Semyon as we made it. Well, thank you for sharing after, it. After that, we used to blend it with um, Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, so yeah. That, that's actually something that I wanted to discuss next. So, I was going to say that, you know, the Semyon is somewhat of a neutral varietal. So, I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, what's the best way to produce, uh, you know, Semyon in order to kind of really exhibit its varietal character? 
Um, <laughs> that's a difficult question. I, 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 I mean, you've, you've put so many words in my mouth there now. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, it, there certainly isn't a one size fits all with this, with this variety. Um, and the way that we made it, I mean, again, you know, I, I took over where, where Andre had, had left off. Stylistically, you know, the consumer wants some, some uh, continuity. Yeah, for sure, of course. Um, and obviously, Andre had proved that the, mm. uh, the, the wine does well in that style. Yeah. So far be it from me to say that I sort of maintained it, to certainly tried to maintain it. Um, but that oak style with the sort of relatively big alcohol, yeah, yeah. I think this one's probably about 14%. Well, it's, right? it's, I saw that now. 13, 13, 13 and a half. half but, probably bloody close to 14. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that's, uh, I was just about to get on now, you're speaking about oak. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely pick up on that, that oak coming through on the palate now. It's quite the, toasted, actually. The interesting thing is that... It's, it's, mm. it's actually, it's, it's great. I mean, I don't know if you did any... Sorry, now, I mean, going back... To imagine what you did in 2009 but would you have done something like botanage on this wine yeah absolutely um and one of the things that we did with with this wine and and not only in this vintage was that we we used to ferment and mature for sort of five or six months not a hell of a long yeah. time um used to complete the fermentation in barrel okay like one does with with white wines in, in berry um, they were big barrels if i recall 2009 would have been in 500 okay. litre barrels um, and malolactic would have been induced but not forced okay, okay. so if it if it went it went if it didn't it didn't okay. it, it was never sort of real very a, natural a major process e. yeah. Uh, yeah it wasn't an, an issue if it didn't complete in fact um, I quite liked the, when it didn't complete the malolactic fermentation it sure. just kept a little bit of the, sort of natural and freshness, yeah. absolutely um but I think that the one thing that we did slightly differently with this wine is that we put it into barrel, um, fermented it and kept it on the, in the barrel for five or six months um, and then took it out of the barrel but took it out with the lease. Okay. I don't know that I'm picking up so much oak, but I'm certainly picking a up quite of, a lot of sort of leasiness. Okay, I've got you. Which, um, which, yeah, I think is quite cool. I, I especially with the sort of the lanolin characters sure. of, of, of the wine. Absolutely. Well, I guess this has already busted that myth to pieces, but there's a myth out there that white wine can't age. So firstly, do you agree with this? And secondly, for white wine to age, what are you looking for in a white wine? Because I mean, think what? about it. How many consumers yeah, but, out there have that set in yeah, their mind? Yeah, but you see, but that's the point is that it's a silly thing to say because it's a total generalization. Exactly. And that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as yeah. it always is. Now, if I had to serve this wine to a large percentage of the white wine consumers yeah. out there, they'd say, no, nah, <laughs> we're not this. Give me a, People are scared of development a, for some odd reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, especially saying that after voting. <laughs> now, yeah. um, the, um, you know, this is, it's an acquired taste. You know, like drinking single malts. It, it, not everybody digs this stuff. You know, it, it, hey, it's If it's pizza, it's, it's the best. Yeah, you see, you say that, but not everybody agrees. Exactly, with, this, yeah. is, this is what you want about. And, yeah. and I think that, for me, this is just absolutely gorgeous. It's, I mean, this is complex. It, it, this is, it's... It's, um, it's it, amazing. It's, uh, yeah. it's a great... So, sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, this is what makes this uh, really special is because, first of all, it is a rare wine. It's a wine that you produced. Uh, the farm is under new ownership. This wine is never going to be produced again. I don't know if they're doing semi on that side anymore, but... Uh, I'm not sure if that vineyard didn't but, exist but I mean, It might, I'm not sure. But I mean, yeah. what I'm trying to say is that this wine, nobody will find anywhere else unless they happen to come and twist your arm and get something from your private cellar here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and no, I'm not sure how many <laughs> bottles I've got left, but anyway, yeah. But, but uh, I mean, so that's the thing. So, as you already know, this is going to go into a mixed case of six, and whoever donates towards my educational campaign, they get an opportunity to expose their palate to something as special as this, so... Yeah, and I think that that you've hit the nail on the head there. You exposed. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. because some people some people talk about yeah, the consumer needs to be educated. I think that um, the word educate is is a little bit of a slap in the face. For sure, yeah, exactly. Because you don't need to be educated and as to what you like to drink or yeah. not. I think rather than educate people, I think that we need to expose people to these type of For flavors sure. um, and this kind of concentration and 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 sort of butteriness and it's, gentleness it's and all the rest of the stuff because this is so far removed 
from a 2022 Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, which is what a lot of people are asking for now at the end of 2021. Yeah, they can't uh, wait for their 2022 yeah, to be released. So, this is so far removed from that. And I think the more we can expose people to these kind of flavors, mm. um, the more we'll find that people actually start saying, hey, you know what? This is quite cool. Yeah. I mean, they, earlier when we were at the, uh, at the boat, and hopefully in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to be crayfishing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, You're there with this. And that's the point, is that when you get to some really lacquer, fresh, steamed crayfish um, with just a little bit of, <laughs> of, of uh, uh, melted butter or some, mm -hmm. maybe some lemon butter, then a wine like this is just absolutely sublime. You know? Yes. Um, and, you know, that's the point, is that one doesn't know that until you've been exposed to it. Sure. And I think that it'll be very cool for, for summer to have or some less it's so incredibly juicy yeah, yeah it's so juicy on the palate now I like I'm so I'm not like wow I mean I didn't expect it to be this good obviously I expected it to be quite special but it's really um, showing itself off right now I think so I think it it, it gets you salivating yeah, and of course absolutely. that's exactly what you for want sure. yeah. so so guys as a winemaker uh, what's been your biggest challenge to date I mean this can be a uh, personal endeavor could be a natural disaster, it could be a specific vintage. What's the craziest thing you've had to deal with as a winemaker? I can't think. I've actually been really fortunate. <laughs> well, that's a good um, thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, the market, marketing and the selling of wine is... is it's, it's to me, it's, 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 it's almost more... Well, it is more of a challenge than <laughs> producing it. You know, when, when you're producing it, um, you're sort of doing what you do. Yeah. Um, when you marketing and selling, you're not doing what you do. You're doing what you think somebody else wants you to do. For sure, it's it's really it's a it's a strange sort of conundrum, um, and so I think that that's sort of really where the challenges lie. Um, yeah, obviously along the time along the years there've been mm -hmm. some sort of more difficult vintages and all the rest of it, stuck fermentations and you know the things that sort of normal sort of day-to-day -day winemaking and, and farming. Yeah. Obviously, you know, a lot of winemaking is, is farming and, and um, farming the, the grapes. Um, and, you know, I mean, you just need to look at this season so far where it's raining every sure, week. See, I was just about to say, it's a, it must be a winemaker's worst nightmare with the rain that we're getting at this time. Well, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a nightmare on the one hand and it's an absolute godsend on the other hand is that, you know, we've got moisture. We yeah. haven't had moisture for the last <laughs> six years. Suddenly we've got moisture in the soil, which... <laughs> a lot of us have sort of like uh, forgotten that we once had, um, which is which is really really cool. But once again, it's that conundrum. It's, oh, sure, but the vines are starting to flower. Yeah, I was just about to say, imagine and, that rain comes during yeah. flowering, then it's going to be an issue. And yeah, then it's an issue. But you know what? It's not something that will happen for the first time, and it's not going to be sure. the last time. Well, that's the thing. I was just about to say, before. as winemakers, I'm guessing it's one of the. Or one of a few occupations where you literally need to just roll with the punches. Absolutely, and the and the thing is not to sweat what you're not in control. Of. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. And you'll drive yourself nuts. <laughs> so, so talking about uh, obviously uh, challenges and whatnot, uh, winemakers also deserve the opportunity to be able to gloat. So, what's your biggest achievement to date as a winemaker? No, no, being able to sit here with you and drink <laughs> a 2009 Sauvignon. <laughs> this guy's way too modest. <laughs> Uh, um, I mean, one of your pinotages picked up a five star, didn't it? Yeah, that was not necessarily my pinotage. That was a pinotage that, that, uh, you, that, you that produced? I made with Jeremy Walker. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I remember. Yeah, for, for Dave Hidden, yeah. for Hidden Valley. Yeah. Um, and that was the first pinotage ever to pick up a five star. First and only. Oh, first yeah. and only. In, in one magazine, that is. Eh? Um, obviously, there have been lots of five star pinotages, but in one magazine, I only ever had that, if I recall. It was only that one pinotage that got five star. Yeah, I mean, that was nice. And Have you got nice. any of that in the back? I've got one bottle oh, left. Oh, yeah. damn. Okay. No, Gareth, and, and, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see uh, how much uh, good work this wine is going to be able to do to go and see if we, if we can get the bottle out later. But, uh, guys, so in terms of winemaker, how many vintages have you actually taken part in? Well, my first commercial vintage was 1989. Let's see, how old was I then? Five. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I joined Bertram's at the end of 88, so 89 would have been my first commercial vintage. Okay. Did you not do harvest after studying? And what no, kind of look, board? I mean, in our day, you traveling really... overseas was a little bit more complicated than yeah. it is now. It was like white wine not being able to age, eh? 
a myth. <laughs> Not <laughs> Indeed, <necessarily>. yeah. <laughs> now, look, I mean, you could. You could travel, but traveling wasn't quite as easy as it is now. You know, the political situation with yeah, embargoes course, and all the rest of the stuff was not quite as easy as it is now. I mean, now it's really fantastic. I remember, um, and I can't remember now exactly which one of my assistants it was at Stillenzacht, but when when she joined me, I think that she had already done sort of five vintages, yes, you know, and, and she'd only sort of finished studying two years before. Yeah. Um, but she managed to sort of skip north south north south in in one yeah. in one year and and put in a whole stack of harvesting, yeah. which is like really fantastic. I yeah, mean, of course. You know, that's that's it really what, shows what it's about. Enthusiasm yeah. and, the, and also the passion that and just really picking up experience and and experiencing wine and experiencing those cultures. Yeah, I mean you're going to take that experience it's that, it's and you're going to utilize exposure it. exposure as part of your education. For sure. Yeah. Okay, so after all this time. How do you stay true to the culture of winemaking and how do you keep yourself motivated? Because I'm sure there's days where you're feeling pretty like you have your air knocked out of you, but you have to get back up. Like we said, we ha you have to carry on rolling with the punches. So what is it that you do? Do you have anything that you, you drink or do you have anything that, that you say to yourself? For me, it's really just what I do. You know, it's, it's something that I love. It's something that's part of me. I haven't got any specific goals that, you know, I really want to do that or yeah, I really yeah. want to win this or I really want to get there or whatever. I really want to make people happy or I want to have wines that make people happy. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and to me, that's sort of the essence. I think it probably, I would imagine that chefs feel like that. You yeah, know? definitely. It's, it must be very cool to be a chef and to put out some food. You've been sweating like all hell in the kitchen. <laughs> um, and you put out the meal and everybody just laps it up. I mean, you, when you take the plates off the table, they clean. I mean, <laughs> that must be incredibly satisfying. Well, we're I, halfway I through that, this already, so this, <laughs> this is exactly what's happening over here with this, this bottle. Soon we're going to be slurring towards that, each other. Yeah, for me, for me, that's that's what it's about. Sure. It's it's not really about medals and all of that kind of stuff. You know, the fact that you can get somebody or that one of your mm -hmm. products can get somebody to take some hard-earned cash out of their wallet. Yeah, for sure. And and uh, buy a bottle of your mm -hmm. wine. I think that's quite that's quite cool. And and yeah. you know, I did a harvest myself in 2014, and mm -hmm. the one thing I've always said to people: at first of all, it was the most grueling work I've ever had to take part in. It was incredibly difficult. It was strenuous. Um, but the relationships that you make with those people under those conditions mm -hmm. are relationships that you'll forever kind of be able to rely on. I th I'm still in contact with everybody in that cellar and I'll never ever forget the time that I spent there. And I mean, to imagine that you've done it uh, over all these years, it must be incredibly awesome. I remember my, my, my record for, for sort of overtime hours was uh, working at Kleiner Zalza <laughs> um, with Marius Lattachan. Okay. And um, I was his assistant at that stage and went to work at sort of like 6.30, 7 o'clock on Monday morning and went home at 2 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. Um, we were harvesting Weisser Riesling at that stage and um, on that particular day and we had a problem with the Riesling is that it blocked all the sieves in the strainer and, and we really, really battled to get the juice out. Was that, um, was that because of the sugar? No, no, it's just because of Riesling just has that really slippery skin. Okay. Um, it, it kind of like on a Okay. Um, it's it's just a difficult variety to drain, and we were using a, a different sort of kind of tank, um, a prototype type of tank, um, and it it just wasn't working the way it would normally with a Sauvignon Blanc. Anyway, we managed to drain it. Um, Mostly because we actually just emptied the grapes onto the floor at about <laughs> three, four o'clock that morning, and then had to pick up and we managed to clean up the place just in time for the first load to arrive on Tuesday. Is this what, uh, what people mean when they say dirty winemaking? <laughs> <laughs> no. um, and yeah, so and you know, then well, the next grapes had arrived, and so that's it. <laughs> Move on into the next day, and yeah, it was really very very long hours and, and physically hard work and it always has been nowadays i'm a little bit older I don't do all the physical stuff anymore <laughs> but um yeah it it's really just it's a it's a great thing to do for sure i think that I, i'm not a marathon runner and i'm not a cyclist in fact um 
I don't get a physique like mine from a whole lot of exercise. <laughs> but I take it that, you know, when, when you run a marathon or you just cycle a, a long race or something, yeah. yeah, you're putting in a hell of a lot of effort and training and sweat and tears and all the rest of the stuff. And at the end of the day, it's that satisfaction with crossing the line that yeah, makes a sure. difference. Yeah, definitely. And I think that finishing a harvest and, and 12 years down the line, pulling the cork yes, and bottle yeah. line like this is you know, crossing that finishing For line. For sure, of yeah. course. I know you kind of touched on this a uh, little bit earlier, but what is Guy, I'm kind of touched <laughs> what is Guy Weber's ethos when it comes to winemaking? I think that there's, there's a lot to be said about being true to the grape and true to the wine and true to... To sense of place. what wine stands for, and well, yeah, a sense of place in a certain kind of wine. But you know, when you're talking about these really, really big brands that yeah. people love all over the world, for sure, sense of place isn't really <laughs> yeah. that much of an issue, and that's not a bad thing. Yeah, it's no, just no, for different. sure. Yeah, for sure. And I think that that's the point: is that you know, wine is so many different things to so many different people that we've got to be very, very careful that we pigeonhole it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you're doing your, your WSET studies now. Um, I think that one, one needs to maintain that balance between being a scholar of wine and a lover of yeah, wine. Yeah, of course, no, no and, for sure. And because neither, when, once you're a lover of wine, you want to be a scholar of wine. And I think that you've got to be careful that sometimes being a scholar of wine doesn't necessarily turn you into a lover. Yeah, no, of course, and, definitely. And I, I think that there's, that's that's sort of where <clears throat> where I where I have always come from. Okay. Yeah. yeah, well, I hear you. I mean, uh, I would compare music as the same thing. You get these guys that are super technical because they studied music, but whether they love music or not yeah. is a different thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I mean, the same way that you bang your head um, playing, <laughs> the, playing the guitar, <laughs> goes, this is this is my head bang. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Guy, um, do you have any advice that you want to give to folks out there who are just starting out with their wine appreciation or wine journey? Yeah, just drink wine. Just drink. That's what I say. Ex expose yourself. Things, drink it. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you're able to, I know it sounds, it's definitely easier said than done, but if you have the opportunity to get yourself a new wine every single week, expose your palate to it, taste it, write notes, because I promise you, if you ever revisit that, that, that wine, the tasting notes that you're going to write are going to be completely different because your palate would have developed. So the more time you spend, the more appreciation yeah, your, you'll your develop. Your palate changes, the wine changes, etc., yeah, etc. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying about about writing notes, making notes, keeping a diary, that type of thing. I know lots of people. Um, Dave Hughes always used to take a, 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 a drop of his wine and put it on his <laughs> on his paper, and when it dries, you can sort of see the different shades of the wine. Um, and I take it that he's kept those records for years, but um, I think that that's probably the one thing that that I should have, could have developed more for myself is a sort of a, a memory bank of wines that I've tasted. I've, I've tasted some really astounding wines, and I can't always remember what they were. It's never too late. Um, or Get yourself where a they diet. were, what the vintages were, but at the time, I really, really enjoyed them, and. and some of them were astounding, you know, where you absolutely gobsmacked by the things. Um, and you know what, I can't actually remember it. But yeah, you know, we've had some wonderful time with friends. I've listened to some great music and I can't remember who the composer was. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's just the way I am. And, and maybe I should have taken more care of that um, and sort of burnt the stuff into the hard drive Sometimes, a little bit better but hey okay, listen no, it's but never it's, been really what i was about but it's the same as if you go for a hike you know sometimes it's not about just taking pictures with your phone the whole time it's about yeah. just taking it in and enjoying absolutely. the moment yeah absolutely so um you're getting look, quite philosophical <laughs> yeah it's the wine <laughs> so um so guy um uh, lastly in terms of this wine how does it how does it feel to drink it after all this time and how do you think the wine's actually presenting itself to you right now Look, I mean, the fact that we have finished off the <laughs> bottle while we've been chatting, I think is testimony to the fact that the wine is certainly very drinkable and very enjoyable. <laughs> um, and it's totally different from what it was when we bottled it. Um, and, the evolution must and, be impressive to see or to taste. Absolutely. And, and just, you know, the wine has grown up. Now, some people will tell you that the wine is actually not only grown up it's now starting to show some wrinkles <laughs> yeah you know, and a little bit of gray and all the rest of the stuff but that's also cool you know what i mean we we do get old the 
the point is that the wine is not dead. Yeah, well, the and, wine is going to live and, until you, and you open the cork. And that's the and that's the point. Sometimes the wine dies in the bottle before. Yeah, you yeah, shame. And, that's, and that's, and that's a sad story. And that's always. a very sad story. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing about keeping wines is that it's always going to be a gamble. Of course. And yeah. uh, but I mean the thing is, is that if that gamble pays off, you really treat it as something incredibly special. Yeah. And that's exactly what we've got of you through the semion today. Yeah. And you don't, you know, when when the ball falls on the red seven and you didn't have bucks on the red seven, well, <laughs> you don't know what the feeling's like. Yeah, yeah you know? for sure. Um, and for me, you know, I think this wine is showing really nicely. And as I, I'll say it again, what I said earlier, there are going to be a whole lot of people who are not going to agree with me, um, not going to agree with you and say that the wine is... is over matured, it's too old, it's lost its freshness, etc. etc. Yes, it has, it's lost its freshness, but you know what? It's got a whole lot more complexity, yeah, it's got a lot more, um, a lot and, more character. And, and the, in the same way that you know, I've lost the natural color of my hair, um, but I've got some gray, and and that's the way that life is. And, and, and wine is just like people in, in, in those terms. Um, I think the wine is beautiful, um, I think it with a Really, really lacquer, creamy risotto. Maybe hey, yeah. that, that that crayfish risotto. That crayfish risotto Ooh, would be fantastic. There we go. No, yeah, but maybe even just some mushrooms, a, a mushroom risotto, but a nice creamy risotto yeah. um, with a lot of good parmesan. I think would be fantastic with this now. I can literally taste um, parmesan as soon as he said it. I could taste it going with this wine. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. But yeah, maybe with a little bit of lemon zest. Yeah. <laughs> So guys, thank you very much for having me this uh, afternoon. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. The wine has really showed itself uh, off incredibly well. And folks, that brings us to a conclusion of today's tasting. And now you've heard it straight from the horse's mouth. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> so again, just let everybody know that uh, this is going to be a six episode series where I'm going to be sitting with a few of my favorite winemakers. And they'll be obviously uh, bringing out wines which are incredibly rare and a single bottle which is going to be donated by these amazing guys and women uh, will be going to mix case of uh, six which you can get your hands on all you have to do is scan the qr code over here which will take you straight to the site give you all the information and you will be able to donate accordingly and before i love and leave you i'd like to remind all of you that there's no standard when it comes to your enjoyment for wine and remember be kind and drink good wine cheers cheers <laughs>